Good morning, everybody. To those here in the auditorium, as well as to those who are joining us via Zoom. Uh, if you've been following us each Sunday morning Bible study, we're, in a, we're completing a journey in the book of Hebrews. And last week, we were blessed to finish Hebrews chapter 3. So this morning, we're going to continue with the beginning of Hebrews chapter 4. And if you've been in the church a length of time, I'm sure you've all heard the scripture, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, which says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, when that was written, he was talking about the Old Testament and is letting us know that the Old Testament does have some things for us. Those of us that are New Testament God's people, Christians. And to me, no other book brings that out more clearly than the book of Hebrews. Here, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, constant, constantly makes references to Old Testament examples so that we can learn from them. Keep that in mind as we enter Hebrews 4, because you're going to hear a lot. Uh, previously, we've heard about Abraham. We've heard about Moses. We've heard about the tabernacle. We've heard about the wilderness wandering, and he's going to keep them things going. And there's something that we as Christians can learn from that as well. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to take verse number 1 as we start off. Here it says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, what is that talking about? Let's first of all look at the, the therefore. Brother Gail always says, when you see therefore, Know what it's there for. The therefore here is reflecting back on something that was covered in Hebrews chapter 3, something previously. And that is the whole, the, the essence of that is there were many that came out of Egypt. Now imagine being saved from the Egyptian tyranny. You're being saved out of Egypt and you're heading toward the promised land. And because you're so stubborn, God makes you wander in the wilderness for 40 years and you never even enter the promised land. So he wants us to reflect on that. And what was the big issue then? They were challenging leadership. They were upset with leadership. They said, why, 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 why? They weren't just trusting God. And their leader, who happened to be Moses, told them, stand by and look at the salvation of the Lord. Red Sea opened up Why? You can wonder, why would they question after that? But they did. Because that's such as the frailty of mankind. That's what the therefore is there. And then, then it says, therefore, let us fear. And that fear here does have a dual meaning. It has a meaning of reverence. We should reverence God. And in so reverencing God, we should be able to take whatever he tells us. And we have ex extremely good examples in the Bible. Of that. Look at Abraham and Isaac. Told him to sacrifice his son. You know, Abraham didn't really want to kill his son. But he, he knew God had a plan that maybe he didn't quite understand until the end. But he went as far as he could. Joshua was told to go around the walls of Jericho with his small army for seven days. A big walled city with a mighty army. Joshua did it because he knew it. Guess what? Guess how the story is. The walls of Jericho came tumbling down just because of their obedience. Daniel went in the lion's den overnight. And if you know the history behind those lions, they didn't feed them for like two or three weeks. So those lions would many times would jump up and grab the food in the air before it even hit the ground. But these men did it because they had a reverence for God, whatever God said we're going to do. Now, there's a flip side of that, of, of the fear here, too. And that is, you should be scared. And mean that I don't want to fall to think about, when I think about when I die, I want to go to heaven. Meaning, you know, through the Hadean world, that's a whole other story. But there should be a fear, and I don't want to go to the lake of fire. There should be a natural fear there. Just like if I walk outside, and somebody blindfolded me and traffic going both ways, and they just said, just walk across the street. I would think, no, I can't see. I may get hit by a car. That's a natural good fear. You think a child who puts his hands on a stove when it's hot is going to do it again? No, he has a fear now because he knows it's going to burn his hand. We should have that as well. The Bible says, let us therefore fear. It says, lest a promise be left. You see, God never just tells you something without giving a motive, natural motivation for us. Jesus left us something. What exactly did he leave us? 
We see it in John 14, verses 2 and 3. It says it so well. John 14, verses 2 and 3. What was the promise being left us? He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is the son of God saying, I'm going somewhere to prepare a place for you. Think about that. This is the son of God saying that to his, his Christian. And then it says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I, I will come again. And for those who tie into the rapture theory, he didn't say I'd come back twice. He says, I will come again. One time. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Isn't that a beautiful thing? What comes to mind to me, I remember when my oldest son, Ricky, was growing up, and he wanted to learn how to swim. And they had some lessons at our local YMCA when we lived down south. And I remember uh, Steph said, I can't go. I need you to take him. I said, absolutely. That's my boy. Drove up there. And the guy said, um, I'm going to need you to leave for a minute because we don't want the parents to have the kids for a little bit. So I took it upon myself to run to the local store to get something to drink. So I went and got something to drink. And I came in. It was just the first session, so it didn't take long. So by the time I got back, I looked. And everybody looked like everybody was gone. I didn't see Ricky anywhere. So I'm making rounds looking. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. And I was thinking of two things. I can't find my son and my wife is going to kill me. And I'm looking around, looking around, looking around. And then I follow my trace all the way back. And he's coming from one direction. I'm coming from the other. And we both locked eyes. He just had tears. And I said, son, I'm sorry. We looked. We were so glad to be in the same place. I told him, I said, son, I would not have went home until I found you. If I would have lost you. Now think Christ saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. How passionate, how sincere do you think he is about that? That's why he gave us this. He's given us, the Bible says, this will make us thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All we need is right here. Do we take the time to try to get the understanding of it? Bible says, get wisdom, it's the principal thing. But it says, in the midst of getting wisdom, Get understanding. There are people that can quote scripture all day long. When I start asking for understanding and interpretation, they don't let scripture interpret scripture. And if you're just depending upon your mental capacity to, to break scripture down, you, you're, on, you're on sandy ground. You got to let scripture interpret it for you. Bible says, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us. And that promise is Jesus has a place for us. And just in knowing that, the next verse, I mean, the next part says, of entering into his rest. Man, that's such, I love how the Bible makes things that may seem, eh, make it so much stronger. When you look at crucifixion and the cross through history, that was a terrible thing. It was brutalized. Matter of fact, they said the only thing worse than that was the guillotine. And then many questions say, no, the cross is worse because the guillotine, you just put, they put your head down and, and that was it. The cross was designed to drag it out, like what we call modern day torture. But you add one word to the cross, and it's a whole different meaning, and that's Christ's cross. Because although it brought him death, he was resurrected, but it brings us eternal life. Look how Jesus just changed that. When you look at death, that's going to be a tough thing, especially if when it's one of your loved ones. But you know what Christ called death? If you die as a Christian, he said you're sleepy. Why would he call it sleepy? Because if you're a Christian, you're going to rise up again one day. And the goal is for us all to be together. Here he calls it rest. You know, when you can rest on something, me and my family love sports. Let's say we're watching a football game and your team is up 56 to nothing. And it's 10 seconds left in the game. There's technically no way you can lose that game. So what can you do? You can rest. Just sit on the ball. I mean, we got this game. It's a powerful now. The rest here pale. I mean, the rest there pales in comparison to the rest that the Bible gives you. The rest we have is knowing that we're solid and grounded in Christ. And we know where we're going. That's some rest. I tell people all the time when there's a shooting or a tragedy, they'll say 15 people died. And I said, you know, that's real bad. But you know what? That's not really the real tragedy. 
What are you talking about? 15 people dead. Yes, I'm not saying that. I'm not denouncing them. But how many of them were saved? How many of them missed the gospel of Christ or were taught it and chose not to obey? That's the real tragedy. Because no matter how you look at the lake of fire, hell, it was never, ever made for a human being. It was made for Satan and his fallen angels. But if you refuse to obey the gospel of Christ, you're saying, I want to go with Satan. Again, I'm going to try my best not to preach this, but sometimes it gets you. There is no in-between choice. You're either in or out. The scripture I love to look at is Revelation, where it says, talks about lukewarm. And we all know what lukewarm is. If somebody gives you, if you put your hand in freezing cold water, you're like, wow, that's cold. You put it in freezing hot water, you go, ow, that's too hot. You need a little mix to make it bearable. But spiritually, lukewarm is considered by God a negative thing. God says, I'd rather you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, he says, I'll spew you out. Spew is an old English term for vomit. Why, do, why, why would the human body vomit? Because there's a foreign material in there that the body is not supposed to have. So it's not going to ask your permission. Do you like this? No, it's going to force itself up against your own will. And many times you've been over a bath, over a trash can or a, or a, or a toilet because it's not supposed to be in there. That's what, that's how lukewarmness affects God the Father. Because he expects what he has done, what he's provided, and his work is finished. What he has provided, he, he would expect us to be incredibly fervent, and passionate people. You know, a wonderful elder that recently passed away, Brother Wooten, when I was at Driftwood, we invited him up to do a lesson. And he said something. He said, you know, we look at these uh, radical terrorists, and most of them, quote unquote, are doing it for quote unquote God. It's twisted. We know that. He says, but look at what they're willing to do for what's false. They're willing to go and blow themselves up. They believe that much in that false doctrine. Now, we who have the true doctrine according to the Bible, because we can prove it by God's word, how far are we willing? I'm not saying we go out and blow people up, don't get me wrong, but are we willing to live relentlessly for the cause of Christ? We have the truth. Mm. Just entering into his rest, it says, any of you should seem to come short. Here's a key piece here, and I love it. Should come short of it. You ever come short of something that's so close? I play a video game. It's called Golf Tee. I love it. I play it on my phone. And every time I, if you get on the green, I can sink the putt every single time, no matter what the distance is. But if it's even an inch on the green, you can't use a putter, and I tend to go over it. Just that big, that short distance, that shortness can make a, make a difference. Now, I love looking at these words. That word comes from the Grecian games. And all it simply meant is he that came short was he who was any distance, no matter how small, behind the winner. Now, you know what that's saying spiritually? What's that saying spiritually? Let's let the Bible speak. We're going to go to 1 Peter 4 and read verse 18 and 19 if you're taking notes. 1 Peter 4, 18 and 19. We're talking about coming up short. The flip side of coming up short, we know those outside of Christ come up short every time. You can't pay your way or work your way to heaven. You have to be in Christ and work. But do we realize as Christians how close we make it? Do we realize that? First Peter 4 and 18. And if the righteous, who is the righteous? Those that are in the church. And if the righteous scarcely be saved. I can stop right there. What does scarcely mean? It means you just make it in. My brother, I didn't wrestle in high school, but my brother did. But I heard a lot about wrestlers. They show up, they would go and weigh in. It's, let's say if they got to be 198, they go up and it's 199. They go, they try to do something just to lose, run around trying to lose that one pound because they were close, but close doesn't count. You have to be in there. And the Bible says Christians just scarcely mean. It says, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God 
commit the keeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In other words, don't take your eye off the prize, not at all. And I love how sports gives a great analogy. And I was watching a game the other day, got basketball game. The guy went up on the dunk. He felt he got fouled. Referee didn't see it that way. And although the, the play ended and they started going the other way, he still, the team was up the other way. He's still arguing about the play. The game is still going. He doesn't realize all he's doing is helping the other team outnumber his team because he can't get over what happened. There's a time and place to argue that. That was not the time. May we as Christians never let anybody get to us to where we're out of our minds or we're pulling away from the church because we're upset about something. The game is bigger than that. Your salvation is bigger than that. Ooh. Now, we're talking about coming up short. I love how Solomon, the wise man Solomon, gives us some more insight about just not just being scarcely saved, but what this race is all about. Because it is a race. I was talking to my son Thomas the other day. I said, the Bible talks about a race. What kind of race is it? I said, is it a sprint? He said, no, it's more like a marathon. I said, exactly. And what's unique, what's unique about a marathon? You may be able to run the first 100 meters in 9-9. You do that in a marathon, you, you got a longer race ahead of you. Because you got to adjust your breathing. You got to pace yourself. And such is the case in Christianity. Watch what Isaiah, I mean, uh, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, and the verse 11. Great insight for us. He says, I return, and just so you know, when you get into Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the whole theme is how God has us in his hand. But just think about that. God has you in his hand. Could you not feel a little more comfortable, a little, a little rest? Me and Gail grew up with a mom who would go to the ends of the earth for us. We knew that. And that gave us such a great comfort now that we had a parent like that. Watch what Solomon says. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. See, Solomon has given us some insight. It's not about how fast you can do it. It says, nor the battle to the strong. He's talking about physical strength here. No matter how strong you are, the Bible says you better be strong in the Lord. He told Joshua that, and Paul tells us that in Ephesians 6. It's all about being strong in the Lord. And he says, neither yet bread to the wise. You see, it's not all about the, the, the mental wisdom. It's all about, are you holding on to what God has told you? Jesus didn't go and get these high intellectuals. He used fishermen. And the, as the history says, he changed the world because they listened to what he said. It says, nor yet riches to men of understanding. It was about how much money you made. As a matter of fact, when you look at the, the New Testament, me and my son was talking about this as well. You look at the New Testament, the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic and, and uh, Koine Greek. Now, Koine is a, is a dialect. The Greek had at least 25 different dialects. They even had one for the, for the upper echelon, the rich folks. Guess which dialect God chose to deliver the New Testament in? Koine, that was considered the language of the common people. That's not a coincidence. The common man was able to understand the Bible. And what's unique about, the, unique about the Koine Greek language? One word didn't have a dual meaning. You've all heard me talk about this. I could say, I love my rabbit. We have a pet rabbit at the house. I love my rabbit. I love my sons. I love my wife. Those are all different types of love, but it's the same word. Wasn't that way in the Koine Greek. When they said one word, it was one depth, so it was easier to understand. So, but the Bible says here, in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11, it says, not yet riches to men of understanding. And then it says, nor yet favor to men of skill. That's where I just think about the Apostle Paul all the time. Paul said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, the tribe of Benjamin. He's talking about his pedigree. But he's saying, I, I count all that as dumb, a waste for the excellency of Christ. See, it wasn't about that. It was about where, who are you in Christ? I'll tell Christians all the time, especially when they get status. Remember. What defines you is your Christianity, not what you do, but who you are. It's who you are in Christ. Now watch this. But time and chance happen to them all. I've, I've heard this scare a lot of people. 
chance? You got to remember the context of this. Who controls time? You realize God, when the Bible says in the beginning, that beginning is the beginning of everything. The beginning of time itself. So that's in God's hand. When it says time and chance, that chance is talking about God's dispositions, what he does within time. The Bible says in Malachi 4, 4, I am God, I change not. People say, well, he's a little bit different from the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament. No, it's just different dispensations. You can look at the, the probably the best example, you can look at the United States. We're a democracy. But you see with each different, with each president, many times we have a different administration. Biden is not running the United States the way Trump did. But it was, they both were considered democracy but quite different, it's because of the administration. God used an administration of law and the prophets at one point, he used administration of the, uh, the, the head of the household, the patriarchs, and then now he's using the law of grace and truth. It's all God, just a different dispensation or a different administration, but it's still God doing the same thing. Bible says, but time and chance happened to them all. What is this telling us if we stay in God? What is this race really about? It's not about first, second, and third. I grew up in track. I understand that very well. And those races were, we had to finish first. That was the goal. The race here, we just have to finish. You know what? It's a little added benefit, added bonus if we help other people finish. That's why it's not designed for the swift. Because if you're focused on just finishing, I got to finish, I got this, I got to get first place, you're not worried about other people. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to be ministered, I came to minister. Let him who was chief be servant of all. That's the kind of race we should be running. That's the very nature of the fellowship we have in the church. It's just that we take advantage of it. You know, the Bible says the fellowship we have with each other has a direct correlation to the fellowship we have up top. I love how my brother says when you tie that, we have fellowship and love horizontally, ties right into the, the, the love and fellowship we have vertically. You know what you have there? You have a cross. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's how it was set up. Bible continues back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It says, For unto us, that us there is talking about the Christians in the New Testament. For unto us, what was it? Was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with the faith in them that heard. Now I've heard people say, wait a minute, they preached the gospel in the Old Testament? This is why it's so important to study those words. The gospel, the general definition of gospel, which is what this is talking about, means just means glad tidings. The gospel of Christ is the glad tidings that only Christ could bring. This is just talking about glad tidings. They received glad tidings in the Old Testament. I mean, say, uh, uh, Moses said, stand by, see the salvation of the Lord. They crossed the water. And there's a multitude of things, glad tidings that they received. It says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. It says, but the word preached did not profit them. Why is that? After all that, after seeing God's, all, all of God's wonderful works, they still didn't enter the promised land. It's like, well, what was the point then? I remember hearing a preacher say, you know, you got to be careful. Sometimes you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Yeah, we want to make it to, to heaven, but we have a job to do. We're the body of Christ. I was telling Thomas the other day, my youngest son, I said, one of the best examples I've ever heard of that on this side of life is there was a, a coach named Tony Dungy. And he had just won the Super Bowl. The time had rolled around. It was time for the new season again. And he came out and did a press conference. And a guy raised his hand. He's like, yes, sir. He said, I have one question for you, Mr. Dungy. Are you guys going to the Super Bowl this year? Keep in mind, they hadn't played the first game yet. You guys going to the Super Bowl this year? He said, well, I hope to, but I'm not worried about that right now. How can you say that? You won the Super Bowl last year. Well, the last time I checked, tomorrow we have our first game. My focus is, if we win that game, great. Then my focus is, we're going to win the next game. And if we do that 16 times, then I hope we can win the playoffs. And if we win the playoffs, I hope we can win the, uh, the, the uh, AFC championship. 
If we win that game, I hope we can, then I hope we can win the Super Bowl. He wasn't, as they say, don't get ahead of your skis. He said, focus on what's here. And as Christians right now, our responsibility is to do the body, the work of Christ on earth right now. And so doing that, then we get to heaven. If we just sit back, oh, this world is so hard. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. What are you doing? The Bible says, blessed are they who die in the Lord for their labors do follow them. And I'm sure we all know what labor is. We have a labor day talking about the work, but this work is in the Lord. There has to be a work that we do in the Lord. The Bible continues. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And I love this because it's showing the difference between belief and faith. They said they believed what God did when he allowed, when he allowed them to cross uh, through the Red Sea on dry ground. But they didn't put their faith with it. They complained to Moses all through the desert and they never entered in. May that not be the case with us. And you may think, can't we, can't we learn from that? That's why it's here. Remember what we said about Romans 15, 4? Whatsoever things were written before time, in other words, before, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning. That was for us to learn from, that we through patience, boy, isn't that a virtue, and comfort, we get that through the word, of the scriptures might have hope. We're supposed to learn from that, folks. Not complain, but learn about it. And the best learning is understanding. Mixed with faith in them that heard. So faith is supposed to be the byproduct of belief. And as I told you, when you dig deep into belief for a Christian, it means to be fully persuaded. See, there are certain things that people can't change your mind on. I think if I spoke all year that two plus two is four, I don't think I'd change any of you guys' minds. I don't see any little kids in here, everybody in here above age to know the two plus two is four. I don't think there's nothing I can do to prove that. Because that's, you're persuaded that is. That's how we're supposed to be. That's what belief means for Christians in the Bible. That there is no doubt what I believe in and what I'm living for is the truth. You see, when you believe that, actions naturally follow. Naturally follow. The example I use all the time, all the time, I'm going to use it again today, is if, if none of you had ever seen an airplane at all, we just still had chariots. But I said, I got a way to get you from here to, let's say, uh, Orlando in about 10 minutes. I'm like, what? Let me see this. It's like, wait, let me show you the plans. I explained to you, it's like a mechanical bird. It can do this. The, the hydraulics and the, the aerospace and everything. And you said, wow, that makes sense. You believe it. I said, all of you said yes. And I said, okay, I got the 747 outside. Who wants to go for the first ride? I wonder how many of you would jump and you had never seen or heard of an airplane before. You see, those that say, yeah, I'm ready, and you step out on a plane, you just went from belief to faith. Until you do that, you have not shown it. Now, that little easy example, apply that to your faith in Christ. What are you doing based upon what you believe? You can believe all day long. Yeah, just one true church. Yeah, yeah. But what are you doing about it? I've heard people say, well, I'm, I get nervous when I teach. You don't have to get up here and teach as a formal teacher. I enjoy that. You have to do Just tell people what you know. And that's it. Me and Gail, when we first came to South Florida, we met a young lady named, uh, I shouldn't say young lady, she was up in age, but her name was Sister, uh, uh, her last name was Blunt. So she was Sister Blunt. And she, she said, I don't, I like the teaching, but I love, I just can't do it. But you know what she did? She hit us up every week. She had somebody for a Bible study. That's what she could do, and that's what she did. I love how my wife says she had a book that says she did what she could. What piece can you play in bringing somebody to Christ? Because we're all held accountable for evangelism, no matter how old we are. Once we understand and value and obey, then we know enough to at least tell somebody about it. And if nothing else, she may have just planted a seed. They may not want to hear it now, but later on when they hear more and they realize this world is crazy. The Church of Christ doctrine is solid. I think it's safe to say it's rock solid. We continue on. Verse 3. 
For we which have believed do enter into rest. Now it's easy to say, well, this is saying that all you got to do is believe. What does that belief mean? Fully persuaded. What does fully persuasion lead to? Obedience. What is obedience? What is that beautiful word for obedience? Trust. Faith. It says, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Imagine if you're in a problem and you're just struggling with it, going back and forth, and you walk up to somebody and say, man, this problem has got me down. And that person tells you, the solution has already been given to you. The example I like to give is imagine I got tall men in my household, both my oldest son and my youngest. Imagine if a seven foot man just slips in two feet of water. Now he's not knocked out, he's still capable, but he's swimming around in the water. Somebody help me. Then somebody stands there and says, man, just stand up. He stands up and he realizes he's five feet above the water. Something so obvious. What God is saying here is our victory is secure as long as you stay in Christ Jesus. What does the Bible tell us? You go to Ephesians chapter one. We're going to read verse four through six. Ephesians chapter one, verses four through six. When was this, when were we made secure? The Bible says, according as he had chosen us in him, talking about Jesus, before the foundation of the world, before God even started time, he secured our salvation. It says that we should be holy and without blame before his love. Having predestinated, that word, we don't have time to go through the whole thing behind this word, but all that's saying is God created a vehicle that as long as you're in that vehicle, salvation in the church, and you stay in the vehicle, you will make it to heaven. It's not saying that he chose some over the others. No, he created the vehicle. It's your choice whether you're going to stay in it or not. Having predestined us unto the adoption. Why is adoption used? Because until we belong to Jesus, we belong to the evil one. Remember, there's no middle ground. And you can't say, well, you know what? I'm going to wait or I'm going to do it a little bit later. We said this before. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. You can hold off a day or an hour. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. The Bible says, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In other words, you've heard the term, you've heard Brother Gale preach on redemption and reconciliation. He bought us back with his blood. And I love how it says blood because a dollar value couldn't be on there because it's priceless. He spilled his blood for us to be reconciled back to the Father. How beautiful was that? And what's amazing, that was established in heaven before any man was born, before time was even born. So the solution is already done. It's just whether we accept it or not, or whether we just hear it and say, I believe it, but then we don't do any actions. It's a dual effect. It has a dual effect for those who haven't accepted Christ because the day is a day of salvation. But it also has an effect on those who are in Christ that we're supposed to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, that principle is universal across the board. Verse number four of Hebrews 4. The Bible says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, now you wonder, he, he says, he said in this place, he said in that place. He's referring to the Old Testament. When did God originally mention his rest, that he would rest? We know it's in the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter two and verse two. In Genesis two and two, this is what God said about his rest. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And then Apostle Paul says, and then in another place, he speaks about us and his rest. Talking about the Old Testament, we're looking at Psalms 95, beginning at verse 7. Psalms 95 and verse 7. You see, 
We're letting scripture interpret scripture. That's what the church does. You don't want to hear my opinion. I might give stories to help give understanding like Jesus did. He uses stories and parables from around him. But it's still, he's standing on God's word. And that's what we're doing. Psalm 95, beginning at verse 7. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. Look how it keeps going back. This sounds like Hebrews. Then it says, when your fathers tempted me, provoked me and saw my work. This sounds like Hebrews. Verse 10, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart. And they have not known my ways. Just like Hebrews. And here's the kicker verse about the rest. Verse 11. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Doesn't it sound like we're reading from Hebrews? We're reading from the book of Psalms. Scripture interprets scripture and is designed for us to learn. May we not be. Have you ever met somebody that's stubborn? I mean, we all have some stubborn in us, but I mean, just won't accept good common reasoning at all. I've met people like that and I try to seek understanding, but it's just, okay, then you, you, you have to suffer the consequence of that. I remember when I worked at Bay Point, there was one particular staff that was just late all the time. And it's hard when you meet their family and the family time, yeah, he's been looking for jobs, he's working now. We're thankful that you got a job. He's showing up to work late every day. And it was tough about working in juvenile justice I mean, people are on shift. And when you, if you work that hours, you're ready to go home. But you got to wait because somebody's late. So it started hurting my team. So you know what had to happen. The consequence was you have to be terminated. Oh, wow, I've been here all this time. I said, you've been here less than a year. You barely made it off probation. And you're late every day. So I'm not firing you. You're firing yourself. What is the problem? Well, no, no, no. I've, how many coaching notes have I given? How many times have I sat down with you? You've chosen not to do this. I don't quickly terminate anybody because I want to make sure they understand why. And he understood. And God made it clear to them. All the goodness that God did, God could have just said, the solution solved. You have my rest to look forward to. Then he went into the, how they cross on dry land. Oh, what else needs to be done to prove that I'm here for you? But they still complain. And God put leadership in place. Moses was the leader to lead the people. They bulked with him. I'll never forget reading where they said, well, we could have just stayed in Egypt and died. There were plenty there were plenty graves in Egypt. How cold blood is that? After all the goodness that God delivered them and how God used Moses to bring them out. But sometimes enough is not enough. Verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 4 as we hasten on. Bible says, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter and enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Was it saying? It's given a priority. We spoke about this briefly last week. You only have yesterday or history. You have today, the present, and you have the future, which has not yet happened yet. At what point are you going to make a decision? You can't do anything about yesterday. Well, I've done so many bad things that you can't do nothing about that now. As far as what happened, you did that. And nothing's happened in the future yet. What's incredible about the present is it can affect your future and it can affect your now. Bible gives us two scriptures, one for help bringing Christians and the other is for Christians. We spoke about it briefly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, for he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I succumbed thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, when you're at the point of salvation, it's not a hard it's as easy as A, B, C, one, two, three. If you make excuses why, you got to look at what the Bible says. Today is the day of salvation. If you've accepted Christ, are you doing the work of the Lord? 
because Matthew 6 and 33 tells us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, that's the church. The Bible says, and his righteousness. That's talking about the right doing. And that's despite what the world teaches. And all of these things shall be added unto you. These things added unto us is not talking about spiritual blessing, not in this context. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about your food, raiment, shelter, and things that you need on this side of life. We don't, that context of Matthew 6 is not to worry about that. We're about your service to God and watch him take care of you. Now, you may have a you go, you may want to say these. He didn't say he's going to just bless you with exactly what you want, but you will have what you need. If you, if you want something a little extra, then you're supposed to be a good steward. And that still ties to God because God has blessed you with time, talent, and treasure. You manage that right, you will be blessed. In our last scripture before we close out for this morning, it says, we may have to hit this twice. It says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remained therefore a rest to the people of God. Now, if you read that face value, it's almost like a contradiction because Jesus did give us rest. What is this talking about? And this trumped me for a good while. I think that word. It's, it stumped me for a long while until you went back and look at that word, Jesus. You know what Jesus is in the Greek? It's the word Yehoshua, that's how it's pronounced. You know what other name is spelled and pronounced the same way in the Greek? The word Joshua. And what Old Testament story has uh, Paul been using thus far? Them in the wilderness and coming into the land of promise. Guess who led them into the land of promise? It was Joshua. Now, what it's talking about is when Joshua led them into the land of promise, that wasn't the rest that God was talking about. That was just a promised land, a place for them to set up. But the ultimate rest would be in Christ. Now, understanding that, now reread it. For if Jesus had, or if Joshua had given them rest, then would he have not afterward have spoken of another day? Then remaineth, there remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. And that's only found in Jesus, not Joshua. And that's for the Old and New Testament people. The lesson is yours.